Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 51 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and as always, the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. Yay! So in this... I don't know, I just felt like you deserved one. Um, So in this episode, we're talking about understanding your life plan, a way to change your script in therapy. I love that title, Bob. What do you love about it, Jackie? I love all of it. I talk about life script an awful lot. I talk about being scripted. That's your scripty stuff and you're in script and things like that. But to actually look at it, the the meat and the bones of it. And I like the way that you said, and to change your script in therapy, because that's, that's the aim really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... You know, I was trained in transaction analysis and you were trained in transaction analysis. Yeah. Um, Eric Byrne, the originator of transaction analysis, 1960, wrote the first book on TA. Um, he defined a life plan as a, sorry, a script as a life plan uh, that you learn early in your life, basically. Yeah. Uh, which people call script. So script equals life plan. Yes. Simpler. And one of the major aims of any transactional analyst or psychotherapist is to help the person understand their life plan, which is often you know, way back in their history that they're unaware of, and look at um, how it may not be helping them nowadays, even though when they formed it, it was you know, a pretty useful one and got them by as best as they could, but maybe doesn't do the job now. It's outdated in some ways. Um, So the first job is to help them understand or be aware of those life choices that make up their path in life. Yeah. How that may not be useful now or perhaps needs adjusting or amending. And that's in TA language is called script analysis. Yeah. It fascinated me when I first started learning about this, the fact that we make these decisions at such a young age, you know, sort of before around the age of seven, it's kind of cemented our life decisions on who we're going to be in the world. And, you know, potentially we're living our adult life still adhering to those decisions i found it blew my mind that yeah and it's interesting isn't it because there's a lot of controversy in some ways so the earlier analysts like freud young and many of the psychotherapy theorists in the last century if you like have come from that position what you've just said Uh um more modern writers, especially in TA, or other disciplines as well, um, have come to ar- argue or have a different um, view of this. So their view would be that we're always adjusting and changing our life plan as we go along according to the crises and developmental milestones that we actually are, are, are going through in life. Okay. So you have different um, commentaries in TA, and I suspect you've got different commentaries in quite a lot of the psychotherapy disciplines about when that life plan is actually formed. And as I said, many commentators in TA see the life plan, if you like, changing, being altered, amended, according to the developmental milestones that person goes through psychologically. Yeah. Which, you know, that again is another thing with being an ex foster carer and working with children. I was fascinated by, you know, the ages and stages that we go through psychological things and the fact that we recycle them over and over again throughout our life. It's fascinating. Mm, mm. 
I, I think that that really is the nut and bolt of psychotherapy, if you like, that the past affects the present. Yeah. And if we look at these repetitive patterns, these repetitive plans that are carried out, which confirm our own identity and a way of being very early on in life, even if they might get changed slightly or not, yeah. depending which view you hold. Um, it's the same process, isn't it? The past affects the present. Yeah. And, you know, even if we look back at those decisions that we made when we were younger, we made them with the best of intentions. And at the time, like you said at the beginning of this, it, they made perfect sense. They were, they were good decisions to be making at a very young age because mm. we look at the world completely differently when, when we're young to what we do, you know, through adolescence and adulthood. Mm. Absolutely. And often we're in a different place where a different stage of life and maybe those early decisions about whether people are okay or not okay about whether people feel okay themselves yeah. may actually differ yeah i mean script theory is often linked to the existential positions that we um have decided about ourselves and other people now in ta they have that whole theory about okay corral on the OK Corral, we put these existential decisions that we made early in childhood at a very elementary level. You know, yeah. I'm OK, you're not OK, I'm OK, you are OK, I'm OK. So, you know, you're not OK. And they have healthy positions and different positions. And that becomes the basis of our early elementary life plan about other people in the world around us. Yeah. And you don't have to really know all that type of thing I've just said, but I think the elementary position about the past affecting the present, which means healing needs to take you know, place developmentally in the therapy jit room, is an important position in therapy. Yeah. So ultimately, do you think people need to know what their script is made up of in order to move out of it and be aware of it? No. Okay. I don't think at all. I think the therapist needs to think about it and ponder yeah. about it. And they may decide to, you know, they might decide to share some of the theoretical components, like, you know, things like injunctions or drivers and look at analyzing person script and talking in the relationship about that. And the two people reflecting on that themselves to go forward. But I do I think that's a necess necessity? Not necessarily. Okay. In fact, somebody who intellectualizes a lot may use that as a process to not change. Yeah, yeah. I found it, I found it helpful. And it just have an, an awareness around it. I know it took me a while to, to work through all the mud in my life script but now I kind of know when I'm in it and I have a choice whether I step out of it again it's it's familiar a lot of it you know when, when for me when I'm stressed or overwhelmed or something's going on I know I'm more likely to step back into those old familiar decisions even though a lot of the time it feels crappy when I do it I still go back to it sometimes yeah and the theory is that under stress, we're more likely to go back to those patterns that we decided upon many years ago. Yeah. We see people that come through our door who want help in solving their problems. They're often unhelpful patterns. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I certainly don't stay in it as, as long or as often now. But it's quite comfortable sometimes. You know, I can be quite introverted at times, and I think that's when I'm kind of in my, my scripty stuff. Yeah, and, you know, I think we can, the more we know about all these things and understand ourselves more, we may choose un, under stress to inhabit that comfortable place, even though we know it's unhealthy. Yeah. And, you know, I... It, for me, I find it helpful to 
to know the things about, you know, wh whether you're a thinker or whether you're a feeler or whether you're a doer or what, you know, what type of, how you connect with another person. I just find that really helpful in all communication and relationships. And, it, it, you know, I get curious about a lot of that stuff. And injunctions, you know, what I know where they come from, but how they can impact on us as well. Well, you know, and, and going back to your question, do you share some of this stuff with your clients? Again, you need to think about the type of client. I, I think intellectual stuff can be a defense of the person might get stuck in that. But if not, you may choose to do that in a relational way and help, help the person understand themselves a bit more and see where the genesis of this script comes from in order to help the person change that. So... When you talk about injunctions, you're talking about negative messages that come from the parent, uh, which inhibit the person's, you know, healthy script or life plan. In, in fact, it's not healthy at all. When you talk about drivers, it's, it, they're often um, the permissions for the parent, which drives the person to achieve and to get on in life as a defense against the no negative messages. Yeah. Does that all help? Yes if they can get to a place to understand what they've decided back then that actually doesn't help them today. Yeah. And that's the difficult bit because we can't remember making those decisions. It's like, yeah, it's th that to me was the, the nuts and bolts of it when I was learning it. How, how do I know what decisions I was making? I get a feel for them. I get a sense of them, but... It's not like it was a conscious thing that I did at a certain age. No, I, I think if you're saying, do I remember consciously all minute decisions I made um, that actually were healthy or not healthy and go to that way of understanding it, I completely agree with you. I think not many people have that type of uh, memories or even reflections. But in a general way, yeah. we might, I can think, for example, in my history, I talk about generally when I decided it was safer to withdraw. Mm. Yeah. Now, I can't remember the exact time date I made that, but as a younger self, think about my younger self, I can probably safely say that I decided to do that way back in uh, childhood when it was pretty toxic to, you know, be in the present. Yeah. Which, you know, it makes perfect sense that, that we would make a decision like that. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, I, I, I therefore, I can understand it in, in, in connection with how it may or may not help me in the present to stay in a withdrawn place when I need to actually be spontaneous or, you know, whatever. So if I'm connecting with past to present, then, then it can often be quite useful to have these relational discussions with clients to be like a Sherlock Holmes uh, of the therapeutic rooms. Yeah love that and that's that's you know one that some people say to me why do we keep need to go in over the past you know why do we keep going back and everything and this is one of the reasons why because particularly in the early part of therapy we need to explore those early decisions and that includes you know family life and siblings and yeah, yeah. so I'll give, you, give you yeah absolutely I'll give you a story so and a true story this is a true one um uh, somebody I'm thinking of for going back a quarter of a century. Um, I'm picking a, a one in terms of, I have to be careful of confidentiality of the hour. So I'm picking a, a, a situation from a long time ago. So I do the assessments at my institute, half an hour, uh, where I listen to the, the issues and then pass them on to therapists. So someone comes in and says, I've come to you because you're my last hope. Well, that's a that's when somebody says that, I, I tend to sort of sigh with th thinking what's going to come next. Um, and she went on to say that she had depression for the last 15, 16, or even further 20 years, which is incapacitating herself. And she'd been on medication. And finally, the doctor said, I think talking therapy might help you and gave my name. And she turned up and uh, we started to talk about depression and her problems and she said that she nothing had worked the medication hadn't really worked and uh, as we talk about this whole process 
I, I asked a developmental question because in my assessments, I need to know a little bit about how the past affects the present. So I tentatively said, and is your mother and father alive and your caretakers or people brought you up? And she said, yes, my mother's alive. And she started talking about her mother. And then she said, and do you know what? And I said, no. She said, my mother was depressed as well. I never really talked about this or reflected about this. Nobody ever asked me. But she started to say, you know, my mother was depressed. And I often used to think about how come she withdrew and incapacitated herself. And I helped as much as I could. Um, and here comes the sort of question I hesitated to ask, but I asked it. So I said, oh, right. So is there any connection between the depression you've got today and your mother's, for example, whose depression is it really that you've got? And she sort of hesitated and then eventually she said, gosh, she said, it's not my depression. Yeah. And I said, well, whose depression do you think it might have been then or is? She said, I think it's my mother's. And there's that sort of moment in there. Well, it was, just, it was an assessment, but it was a sort of moment where a light bulb had gone on her head and she couldn't quite work it all out. But she started to realize that maybe it was never hers in the first place. And then she said, well, what do I do about it? So I said, well, you could give it back to her. So oh, you yes. have to have it. And she said, how do I do that? I said, well, first of all, let's send you to a therapist who can help you do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so that was great. Sent her to the therapist. And then one morning I was coming in quite early on and I, I, I bumped into her in the therapeutic cut in the corridor. Uh, from, it's about seven months on. And she said, I must tell you, Bob, what's happened. I couldn't quite remember her, but then I remembered her. She started to talk. She said, I've passed. I've handed the depression back. You know, I feel a lot lighter. And then she said, I said, congratulations. She said, well, what do I do next, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, go back to your therapist and talk to him about what you do next and how you can be different in the present. So there's how the, there's a pure example, a real example of how the past affects the present. Yeah, that's amazing. What a, what a lovely thing. And I can see that happening. You touched on something that I think is really important there. What's that? What do we do when when we heal well i think the first thing is awareness i i've had an awful lot of clients not just necessarily recently but the kind of attached to their suffering and they they have increased anxiety when they're bordering on letting it go or giving it back to whoever it belongs to oh and yes the fear for them about making that change yeah because that's what they've been used to yeah I mean, in a previous con a podcast i'm sure we talked about cure yeah yeah and i think the beginning of all this is awareness our oh, first step i think is motivation to want to change in the first place but i think awareness is very very important because without awareness that there's something wrong or, you know or the discomforts really you know so painful you can't carry on uh you wouldn't come to therapy in the first place. So you need to be aware at least that change is possible. And then there's a whole process of change, you know. So when you say, uh, I don't know what the question quite was, but I read it as what constitutes uh, getting better. I think the, this is, well, I think it's one of my famous sayings, which I know you know, but I'll say it again. It's a process, not an event. Yeah. So this process starts with motivation and awareness. Yeah. And then it's, from there, we can go forward. Yeah. It's the clients that fear cure because they don't know how to be any other way. Mm. You know, the, there's, there's a grieving process sometimes when... Well, you see, I think, yeah, you are right, but I think it's more than that. I think it's the clients that fear change and yeah. fear vulnerability a fear of being out of control that have, have the biggest issues. Yeah. I talk to some clients about having a worry bucket and it's like when it's getting empty, 
they've got to fill it back up with something because they don't know how to be any other way. It's like, well, actually, your life is going swimmingly at the moment. You don't need to be putting things in that bucket anymore. Yeah, and this is where the therapist comes in. So that's why I said this is a process, self-awareness, motivation, all these other things. Yeah. The, the therapist needs to help the client, you know, um, in the process of putting a new life plan or a new yeah. script back on the road. I mean, they can't do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really good way of saying it. it it's, you know, making a new nap life plan. Mm. And that so help. Yeah. It yes. Help because the 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 sense of um, predictability, the sense of um, that those deciduous decisions which, you, which we made to survive are so strong. Yeah. That without the therapist protection, potency, and help to actually put a new life plan on the road. Therapy often won't ha happen because yeah. they're so people are so afraid of change, vulnerability, loss of control, having feelings, all those sort of things. So this is where the therapist is really important in terms of containment and helping them with a, a torch so they can see the road. Yeah. So you can go down it together. Yeah, I love that. And you know, life script is like a map, isn't it? We we kind of we're following it so it's about getting a new map and finding because it's it is new and it is different it's kind of like uncharted territory when you're making changes mm. yeah absolutely but you need to you need to do it together yeah people cannot do it by themselves because they'll because uh, you know the, you know they the best will in the world and i know you've got two hands to perhaps have a torch to shine on the map but you need someone else to, to guide you along the way that knows the way yeah to a certain extent yeah which is lovely because i see that's what therapy is all around it's being alongside somebody while they're taking that journey and things it's not about dragging them along kicking and screaming it, you yeah, know there's a, there's a great book called and i don't know who wrote it so i'm going to say it's a great book and i'm thinking it's a very it's a very old book and i wish the top you might know who's written by it's called a road less traveled which is all about what we're talking about. And it's yeah. about it's all about the therapist going along this new road in a relational way, uh, in the process of helping the person develop and integrate a new life plan in their lives in a more healthy, sp you know, spontaneous way. Yeah, I love that. Because life, you know, is full of traps and pits and things you know what I mean and sometimes we avoid them and sometimes we fall in them and it's about you know how do we get out of it and you know things like that so I can literally visualize a map while you're talking with all these different twists and turns in it yeah and a torch as well yes so you need a torch. yes yeah, so you can see yeah. yeah you both hold that torch together hopefully as you start to take ownership of the path and the new way of being yeah yeah that's lovely well you need a therapist to help you in the process yes you can't do I it yourself when i was kind of on, on you know unearthing mine it was really difficult well if you're doing it by yourself it would be well yeah and you know when you're talking about the drivers and you know injunctions and things like that it it was really difficult for me to work out my drivers which is not surprising because one of them is a be perfect so for me to 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 find anything that was negative or wrong about me it was really difficult so I, I quickly found out that one of mine was to be perfect and to get everything right which again in a therapy situation can be quite I don't want to say traumatic but it's hard because we don't like making mistakes or getting it wrong you know, and I fell into that trap of performing in the therapy room mm. because I needed to get it all right. Mm. Very common. Yeah. And it, it's, it's just, you know, being able to step out of that now and look back on my behaviour then. I don't want to say it's laughable, but I was literally in my driver behaviour for a long time when I was in therapy. Mm. Mm. Well, things become habits as well. 
Yeah. There's a book called Habit, which I really like. It's just simply called Habit. And again, I can't remember who wrote it, but anyway, and they talk a lot about habits and how many times you carry out a ritual or a transaction uh, that it becomes entrenched as a habit. And I was surprised how little it was. So, and I can't remember how many times, but, you know, whether we call them, in, you know, entrenched patterns or entrenched habits, yeah. we need somebody to help us and give us a helping hand to move away from that and help us not slip back. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, as always, Bob, it fascinates me. I, you know, it, it's one of the things I'm so pleased that I did 10 years ago was start this journey because human beings just fascinate me. <laughs> How mm. we, we're all unique and individual and, you know, yeah, our, our life script, our, you know, upbringing, the family that we're born into, the environment, everything, it all plays a part in it. Yeah, and I think TA, TA uh, therapists have this theory of the life plan or scripts. You know, other, other therapies do. You know, they might use the word schema therapy. Um, so, so, but, you know, all psychotherapy uh, disciplines, and I think TA has got a good personality model here and a good, you know, thinking about scripts, but they all hopefully come from the idea that the past affects the present. We need to look at the patterns and the scripts and the life plans which stop us actually being the person that we want to be today in 2022. Yeah. And have and the therapist and yourself start on the quest to you know, change some of this together. Yeah. Find a new way through the whole process, which is more healthy and you know is has more light attached to. The way of living yeah the other thing that that sometimes comes up with clients for me when they have that you know light bulb moment like your when you was doing that assessment and she said oh my god it's not mine it's my mom's is you know the, there can be a bit of shame around it that they've lived their life thinking this for so long that you know there's a lot of judgment they put on themselves for why did i not know this sooner why yeah yeah now that's very true and you need to help the person deal with that shame you need to help them find a way to be less hard on themselves and to you know come to terms with the process which usually comes of course from an you know another place altogether and for me you know one of the things i always say is that if you knew a better way to do it you would have done it at the time, the decision that you made was the best that you could come up with. You know, mm. yes, you, like you say, we're in 2022 now and you would probably make a different decision. But at that time, it was a good decision to make. Especially for your younger self. Yeah. So it's like as you start to try make these transformation, transformational changes, then uh, that's a wonderful thing, I think. Yeah. Uh, I always find that pretty humbling to be part of somebody on a journey when they make such transformational changes yeah it is so i uh, want a good place to end it bob wait good yes so i shall see you in the next episode where we're going to be talking about the courage to be human in the therapy room Oh, well, this will, this is following on from what we've been talking about. Then. It is. It's a good one to follow on from. And what number episode are we up to next, Bob? I don't know. You know, I lose. T t <laughs> I'm sure you're going to tell me. It's 52. We've done a year. 52. The my next God. episode is the well, second episode. I think we should give ourselves a pat on the back. I think we should. I think we've done well. We've mortared through this last 12 months. Look at all the changes we've been through. So yeah. until the next time, Bob, I shall see you very soon. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.